everybody. My name is Miss Carol, and you might be looking at me and saying, Miss Carol, what are you doing wearing that outfit today? Well, I'm wearing this outfit today because I'm going to be reading you a story about an early female aviator, a female airplane pilot, and this is the kind of outfit that she wore. Now, I wanted to show you one thing in particular about this outfit. In addition to the helmet, and she would have worn goggles, I'm wearing my glasses, you'll see that most early pilots wore a scarf like this. And you might say, why did they wear a scarf like this? And the reason they did was partly for warmth because they were flying in open air cockpit airplanes. You're gonna see in a minute. It, uh, in fact, I can show you a picture right here. See how they're, she's just in the open air as she's flying and it's very windy, so it's cold. But partly because her airplane had its engine, its motor, at the front of the airplane, I'll show you a picture. And the oil from that, from that motor right there, the oil would, would fly back into the faces of the pilots. And so they wore this scarf to keep themselves healthy because it would keep the oil, it was called castor oil, it would keep that oil from going into their nose and their mouth and from making them sick. So if you sometimes see people wearing scarves or wearing masks outside these days, they're wearing that as well to help keep everybody healthy. So now I'd like to share with you this story of Soar Eleanor. It's by Tammy Lewis Brown and Francois Roca did the pictures. Soar Eleanor. In 1917, that's over a hundred years ago, some girls dressed their dolls. They played house and hopscotch, jump rope and jacks. But one little girl wanted more. Eleanor Smith was born to soar. Soar means fly. Six-year-old Eleanor read a sign posted in a Long Island potato field. It said, airplane rides, $5 and $10. Flimsy as a box kite, the farm and pusher, that was this airplane right here, coughed and rumbled across the field. Eleanor begged her father to let her hop aboard. $5 was a lot of money. $5 bought a week's groceries in those days, and rickety flying machines were dangerous. But Eleanor's father knew what it was to have a dream. He was a vaudeville showman who danced on Broadway. And Tom Smith knew his daughter, so he knotted her blonde braids together to keep them from blowing in the wind and lifted Eleanor and her little brother Joe into the cockpit, fastening the seatbelt around them both. <clears throat> you see her with her braids and her dad and her brother, all eager to get in the airplane? <coughs> Then the pilot gunned the engine. Wind pushed past Eleanor's face as the ground fell away. Clouds broke and shafts of sunlight bathed the fields in yellow and green. The potato farms and oceans spread out like a map, she said later. I was free like I'd flown to heaven. As soon as they landed, she wanted to go up again. Do you see her and her brother crowded in that front seat? The pilot's in the back seat, in the back cockpit and he is steering the airplane. When Eleanor was 10, she began flying lessons. Her teacher strapped blocks to the rudder bar so her feet could reach it, then taught her how to guide the control stick. To Eleanor, the engine's exhaust was a spicy perfume. She will fly one day with the great ones, an old pilot said. She has the touch. And there you go. See her climbing into the airplane? At 15, Eleanor thought she was ready to fly alone. Her father said no. She had to wait until she was 18. But Eleanor's mother knew what it was to have a dream too. When she was a girl, she had hoped to have a singing career, but her parents wouldn't give her voice lessons. And Agnes Smith knew her daughter. If flying airplanes is what you want to do, she said, be like the US mail. Don't let it rain, sleet, or snow don't let rain, sleet, or snow deter you. 
So Mrs. Smith hired a new instructor, Russ Holderman, and Eleanor began to train for her solo flight. Every morning, Eleanor woke before sunrise, pulled on her brother's knickers, those are his, his pants, and an old leather jacket and headed off to the airfield to meet her teacher. She practiced takeoffs and landings. Pilots call them touch and goes. She landed her plane, tapped the ground for a moment, then slammed the throttle to the wall and climbed back into the sky. She did this over and over until it was time to park her plane and head off to school. Soar, Eleanor, soar. And there she is in her bright red airplane. One day, Mr. Holderman climbed out of the cockpit. Take her around, he said. She's all yours. Eleanor hesitated. She'd learned to land only 10 days before. Was she ready to fly alone? It's now or never, she thought, as she taxied down the runway. She climbed to 1,000 feet and leveled off. In that instant, she said, I knew I was home and would never turn back. She practiced banking turns, then glided in to land with a gentle bump. She had done it. She had soloed. She had gone alone. Looks pretty happy. I would be too. From that moment, Eleanor loved to fly. She lived to fly. The day was her, the, the sky was her playing field. The hum of the wind rushing through her plane's wing wires was her favorite song. She flew upside down, right side up, and sideways. She learned to handle fire in the engine, ice on the wings and fog-filled skies. She practiced emergency landings in grassy fields, along sandy beaches, and on the water. Finally, in August 1928, Eleanor earned her pilot's license. At 16, she was the youngest flyer in the United States, boy or girl. Soar, Eleanor, soar. But not everyone thought Eleanor should fly. Girls shouldn't mess with machines, some people claimed. Airplanes were for men and boys. Newspapers wrote that Eleanor was just playing at being a pilot. They called her the Flying Flapper. A swaggering stunt pilot who'd crashed his own plane said girls should stay on the ground, grumbling about that kid with freckles who they let fly around every day. He bet Eleanor couldn't fly under one of the bridges across New York's East River. She'll never try it, he whispered to the other pilots, reporters, and anyone who would listen. She's not good enough. Eleanor surprised him. I can do it, she said, any time. But she wouldn't fly under just one bridge. She'd zip beneath all four. The Brooklyn, the Manhattan, the Williamsburg, and even the Queensboro Bridge. There they are, those guys doubting Eleanor. No one had ever flown a plane under all four bridges. Flying under any bridge was dangerous. Swirling gusts of wind could slam a small plane into a bridge's stone pillars. Flying under bridges was also illegal. The government could take her license away, and flying was her life. Careful planning was her answer. Eleanor visited New York City and inspected every inch of her route. I hung by my heels from all those bridges, she joked, checking everything out. She calculated speed, distance, and weight, and studied tide tables and the design of each bridge. Her nimble plane, a Waco 10, had a wingspan short enough to slip between the bridge's footings. Those are the things holding the bridge up in the river. Skimming the water's surface over Man Manhasset Bay, she practiced by weaving through ship's masks masts like a skier attacking a slalom course. She was going back and forth between the masts. And there she is, checking out the bridges, looking below. Finally, Eleanor was ready. She'd fly low just above the East River, beneath every one of the four bridges. And she'd fly slow too, barely above a stall, almost stopping, in fact. She thought she'd planned for every possibility. Still, what if a gust of wind smashed her into a bridge support or a ship blocked her way? Let's see her there getting ready. On Sunday, October 21st, 1928, 
Eleanor slipped on her lucky sneakers and a red leather jacket, easy to spot if she crashed into the river and had to be fished out. She was just 17 years old. As she prepared for takeoff from Roosevelt Field, someone tapped on the cockpit. It was the world-famous pilot, Charles Lindbergh, the first to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Non-stop, there he is. Good luck, kid, he said. Keep your nose down on the turns. There he is, telling her to be careful. Eleanor flew down the river, scanning for hazards. The water glimmered silver and white. Over her shoulder, she saw trees and green fields of Central Park. Sunlight and shadows played among Manhattan's tall buildings. Then something surprised her. Near the southern tip of the island of Manhattan, the Brooklyn and Manhattan bridges huddled closer to one another than she'd expected. Starting here from the south would be like threading the eye of a needle, even in the little wacko. Palm sweating, Eleanor changed her plans and headed back up the river. She would start from the Queensboro Bridge, flying north to south, saving the toughest part for last. There you are. Do you see that bridge? Do you recognize what bridge that is? Yeah. That's the Brooklyn Bridge. You can see its famous towers. The Queensboro Bridge reached across the water, wide and sturdy. Its foundation carved of gray stone and its structure a tapestry of steel. As she flew closer, Eleanor spotted someone waving a white scarf from the bridge deck. A newsreel reporter, now the government would have proof captured on film that she'd flown under the bridges. Would they use the newsreels against her to take away her license? One thing was certain, this flight had to be perfect. She wagged her wings to salute the film crew, wagging them like that, and pushed the stick forward. Eleanor had calculated the clearance between the river and the bridge, but, she, but as she ducked beneath the Queensboro, she was in for another surprise. Heavy wooden blocks dangled from ropes tied to the bridge deck. She held her breath, pointed the wacko's nose down, and dove toward the river, nearly kissing its surface. She weaved between the blocks, just as she'd practiced with the ship's mast, and zipped out the other side. There she is. And you can see people are seeing her below. Eleanor flew on toward the Williamsburg Bridge. The motor seemed to growl deep and low as she pulled back on the throttle and slipped down to the water. Waves almost lapped her plane's belly. Slow and steady, Eleanor glided beneath the bridge. Just ahead, the Manhattan Bridge hovered before her. It seemed to float above the river from a grid of thick cables. Streetcars ran along the top deck, automobiles on the bottom. Eleanor waved to spectators, then dipped beneath the bridge. A nudge to the throttle and she made it through. Now there was only one more bridge. There it was just a few yards ahead. It's huge granite towers rising from the muddy, murky waters. The Brooklyn Bridge, some say the Brooklyn Bridge is New York's greatest bridge. That day it was Eleanor Smith's greatest challenge. Eleanor had considered currents, airspeed, and fuel, but she couldn't plan for river traffic. A tanker chugged beneath the bridge. Eleanor thought her little wacko would have enough space. Then, as she swooped down toward the bridge, Eleanor saw something else, a Navy destroyer plowing toward her. Tanker on the left, destroyer on the right, they filled the river and the air beneath the bridge, leaving little room for Eleanor. Could she squeeze between the ships? Do you think she's going to make it? What do you think she's going to have to do? She yanked the control stick, ripped the wings, and flipped her plane into a vertical bank. That means she's going like that across the bridge. Eleanor flew under the Brooklyn Bridge. How is she flying? You're right, sideways between the two big ships. She had pulled it off. She had flown under all four bridges. Eleanor circled the Statue of Liberty as boats in the harbor shot up plumes of water and blew their whistles in salute. Soar, soar, Eleanor! 
Then she headed home to Long Island, the crisp fall breeze swirling around her tiny wacko. Eleanor flew over the patchwork of Long Island's potato fields, where she'd practiced for her flight under the bridges, where she'd soloed and carved and earned her pilot's license, and where, 11 years before, she'd climbed aboard an airplane for the very first time. She came in for a perfect landing, and a crowd surrounded her, her mother, her father, her brother Joe, famous pilots and reporters, and dozens of others. Hooray, they cheered, congratulating Eleanor with hugs and pats on the back. But what would the New York City officials think, or the Department of Commerce in Washington, D.C.? Would they take her license away? New York City Mayor Jimmy Walker called Eleanor to his office. Heart pounding and stomach tied in knots, she listened as he told her that he admired her bravery, but that she'd broken the law. Then he issued her a short suspension from flying. A few months later, he asked Eleanor to name a plane in the city's honor, and she did. Soon, Eleanor got a letter from the Department of Commerce. They told her to stop flying under bridges, but tucked inside the official letter was a handwritten note asking for her autograph. Her license was safe. With her plucky spirit and lots of hard work, Eleanor had achieved more than anyone thought possible. She was a real pilot now, a professional aviator. She'd shown the world what a girl could do. A girl could soar. And that is the story of Soar Eleanor by Tammy Lewis Brown. And you can learn more about Eleanor if you read this book, which you will find online, I will send you, share a link about it. And also online, another link I'm going to share is to a website that was uh, created by the author, Tammy Lewis Brown, which focuses on one woman pilot every day of the year, 365 entries in all. It's a pretty cool website. Now, I don't think you have a spare airplane outside your door, but you can fly without an airplane, and I'm going to show you how. First, I'm going to show how airplanes fly, and that is because of lift. It's because the air going across the top of a wing is moving faster than the air below the wing, and you can show how that works by just taking a piece of paper like this and blowing across the top. Here I go. Ready? See how it lifts even though I'm blowing across the top? So that's easy to try at home. The other thing you can do at home is make your own paper airplanes. Here's one I made. Let me see if I can fly it where you can see it. Did you see it fly away? This airplane is very easy to make. And I'm going to tilt this a little so you can see how I'm doing it. I can make this work here. Here we go, one second. There we go, I'm gonna make this a little higher so you can see it. And I'm gonna fold an airplane like this. The first thing I'm gonna do is fold my paper. It's just a piece of, of regular typing paper. I'm going to put that folded in half on my board, so it's folded in half. And then I'm gonna fold each of these halves in half again, like that, and again, like that, so I have it folded like that. And then I'm gonna do it again, folding it again like that, and folding it again like that. So it looks like this, you can see. So I folded it in, I folded it in again to my middle line. And then finally, I'm going to take this and I'm going to fold each. I'm going to turn it over like that. And I'm going to fold it in half so it's a, kind of a pointy triangle like that. And then I am going to fold each half out like this. One and two. I folded it in half and half, and then I folded each half down and down. And there are more detailed instructions online, and you have an airplane, 
and you can fly it away. So I hope you find somebody in your household and decide to fold some airplanes and go flying and see who can fly the air, their airplane the furthest. I have lots of different designs that I'm going to link you to on my website so you can try different ones and see which ones work better. If you want to, you can fly them outside and you'll see how the wind affects the flight or you can just fly them right inside if it's a, a, a day or a, a bad day or if you're inside. I hope you have a lot of fun with this. I hope all of you soar and I'll be back with you again soon. Everybody take care. So long and soar. Bye.